we start, I just want to know, if this is your first time here, red pins are right across the wall. <laughs> thank you, Anne, on many fronts. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, but also thank you for helping so much in planning this. And to Chris, Chris and Anne were really instrumental in planning this. So today's program is going to be in four parts. And the first part is going to start with Claudia, who's a local author. And Claudia and I have been working pretty hard on stopping the sale of the hind. So um, Claudia is going to start it with history. Then Rosemary has been volunteering in hind for 39 years. And she's going to talk about her experiences. Dan's mother was a resident of the hind. And he's going to talk about his experience as a family member. And then I'm going to finish up with what has been occurring at county commissioners meetings since August of 2017. And the question that we got, we, we did the same program Tuesday night, and the question that we got, it was, uh, why, why are you and Claudia doing this? Okay, because uh, Rosemary volunteers there, Dan had somebody living there, and we don't really have a connection. Uh, and we're doing it because it's our community, and this is a social service, and from everything we hear from everyone, it is a gem of a social service. And, and we, we feel like it should be I'm Rosemary Sullivan Sandman, and I've been volunteering up there at the time since 1980, so 39 years. I started volunteering there when I worked at Lucent Technologies AT&T because they actually helped fund the projects that we did up there. We not only did bingo, but we um, actually adopted a unit at the time. We were in the old, old building. So we were in all the buildings, all three buildings. But the old building, we, we had unit A. So we came in, we decorated every holiday. We had Christmas parties. My dad was Santa Claus. So, and the uh, individuals who worked at Lucent would also give donations for bingo prizes and things. And we always had money to do that as well. And that's how I got to know Crystal. And, her husband here, uh, Vince worked as an engineer where I did and I used to recruit him to do volunteer work. I was in charge of the future pioneers at the time. So when Lucent closed, we were gonna, it's like, who's gonna be doing bingo? And I had asked my church then to take it over, St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church in Reading. So we have been going up there since 1980 under two people actually, you know, helping. But when I worked at Lucent, I also volunteered at other nursing homes, two of them in fact, and I've had loved ones in other nursing homes. There is no home that is as clean and neat as Burke's home. It is not only the resident's home, but I consider the second home. I've been going up there since 1980. Some of those individuals are like my grandparents. My grandparents are deceased. So I know a lot of them by name. I know some of the staff by name. It, it's just a homey, homey place. And no other nursing home was I in was it like that. Many of the nursing homes that I've walked in where I had relatives, when you walk in, you have the odors. You can smell it right away. When I work, I was just at Burke's Home on Wednesday. We volunteered, we volunteered normally the first Wednesday of the month for bingo, but the first Wednesday was January 2nd, so we pushed it out a week. And I even said to my husband, we were wheeling the residents back to their rooms. I said, do you smell anything? No, no. It's like she's saying, the quality of care. I've had people that I know, Mr. Heller, a friend of our family, who was at another nursing home, was getting bed sores. He was getting urinary tract infections. What did they do? They said something to me. I said, get him to the home. And I, anybody who comes to me, I say, I volunteered in so many places. The only place I would ever send my loved one is the home. You know, I had to become power of attorney of an aunt after the other power attorney was or already had her in a nursing home. And I had to report that nursing home twice for different things that happened. And one of the times was they said they fed her and she wasn't fed. Because I went out and I said, show me her tray. 
They lifted the lid and all her food was there. You know, you shouldn't have to pay to have a loved one in a nursing home and then have to micromanage them to make sure their loved one's being taken care of. I have never seen that. And being a volunteer and I go into the rooms, people are well kept. They have their dignity. And to me, when you become an elderly person or a young person, I've seen many young people up there, your dignity is important. And I've seen nothing but that. I did want to mention, like, there are so many other volunteer organizations that go up there, just probably as long as I have. I'm looking right out here at my sister-in-law. Her mother used to come up there and volunteer. She comes and helps volunteers with us. There is a really fun group that comes, and it's dog therapy. They were up there the same night we were there, and they had little puppies. The residents love that. When I uh, first got my golden retriever, I used to take Allie up there. And it was amazing how much the residents, I used to say, I don't care, they don't care if I show up. They just want to see the dog. And the other thing they want to see is kids. We bring, we always tell the families, bring your children. And right now we have, um, we like to get the youth involved because they're the future and I'm not going to live forever so we wanted someone else to get involved. So right now Alvernia University, they're nursing students, it's not the nursing students, they're uh, rehab, therapy type uh, schooling. They've been coming up and assisting. And they've been so cool about it. They've actually been having campaigns at Alvernia University for bingo prizes to bring along. So not only is our church involved, but we got Alvernia students involved as well. And I just think it, it, it's such a neat thing. And as I said, with the family approach, when I walk in there, I know Edie by name. She's the greeter. I know Carl, the security guard. We mainly come at second shifts. I don't know the day shift nurses, but for a long time, the second shift nurse, Joni, she was the head nurse. So if anything was going on, I would go out to Edie and say, hey, can you get Joni? But they always had an aide there to help us. In the other places that I volunteered, most of the time they just throw you in a room like this. You have to set it up, you have to clean it up, and nobody was there to assist us. When we are in at Bingo, they always have a, a, an aide in there with us in case one of the residents has an accident. Because what do they do? They take them out and they clean them up right away. They're not going to sit in their urine and feces or if they're sick. And I have not seen that other places. I just want to <laughs> wrap it up by saying 39 years there, I, I am afraid, really afraid, of what would happen if a private firm would take it over. I just don't see it being run the same way. I also have my mother, who is 83. I was running a little late today because she had the flu. And if I had to put her anywhere, that is the only, only place that I would want to have my mother at because I know the quality of the care. I know how well the staff treat them. I've talked to numerous people, a friend of mine from work, his wife's there, and she's not that old. She might be in her 60s, she got a rare disease. She was put in there three years ago, probably at the age of like 65. And she's gonna have to live the rest of her years there. He comes every day to see her. She's always well kept. So, I could end up there. You know, I, I'm 57. Who knows what our future holds? But if something happened to me and I had to go somewhere, that is my place that I want to go. And I want it to be there for me and my family. And that's all I need to say. So I know Dan has family, I guess, that was up there. So I'm sure he could speak better than I did about the care. My name is Dan Roberts. My mother, Norma Roberts, was a resident for several years at, the Berks, at Berksheim. Um, first of all, I think you need to know my background is in healthcare. I was uh, in healthcare in several states, but mostly here in Pennsylvania. If any of you know of the old Reading Rehab out on Route 10, I worked there for 15 years. Do you all know about that place? Okay. 
If you knew it back when I worked there and saw it today, you would see two different institutions. I don't mean to be bad-mouthing anyone, but I have seen what privatization of a really great institution can do. And it wasn't going up, it was going down. We went from 400 staff to, I don't know, maybe they have about 100 now, and it's like a ghost town to what it used to be. I have seen in other institutions what has happened when it went from public to private. And everything that has been said today is exactly what happens. It's not your care that they're looking at only. They're looking at what can I make from you and everybody else in that institution. That's sad when it comes to the health care of people, when it comes to our community and what has been given as a history. We want to see our people taken care of, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're young or old. And I must say, I'm here for one other reason than telling about my mother, and it's just what you said. I'm 71 years old. I know what I feel like of a morning when I get out of bed, when I can't do the exercises I used to be able to do, can't run without huffing and puffing, and I realize that getting older is, not, is a great challenge. My dad, who died at 90, said, it ain't easy, son. You know, it's not for wimps. Unfortunately, young people do get hurt as well. Part of my work at Reading Rehab was working with the head injury team. And we saw many young people come in from motorcycle accidents, um, other reasons. Uh, a young man who worked for a tree trimming uh, company fell out of a tree 30 feet, had a head injury. He had to go to a nursing home eventually. My mother, Norma Roberts, was 99 years old, still living on her own. When a series of accidents, uh, falling, caused her to go to several rehabs and finally end up at the age of 99 at Berksheim. I don't know if you remember Norma Roberts or not, but I, yeah, yeah. Because she lived till 104, 104. And she was active in her wheelchair, and uh, this is the way she'd go down a, a, a hallway. I'd actually have to hold her back. You know, she had so much energy. The reason she ended up there was because of uh, back injury, spinal stenosis. She could not feed her or uh, dress herself. She could not toilet herself, and so we needed to look. I needed. I'm the only family she had, only family. So here's a very important thing I did. Medicare has on their medicare.com because of any institution that, re, uh, that receives Medicare monies has to be uh, surveyed every year, evaluated. And out of that evaluation, they put on their own list, uh, or their own uh, website, a listing of all the things that they evaluate, including bed source, medication mix-ups, deaths, all kinds of things. I compared their result, at, and they will then show every institution within your county as to how they compared. And do you know where Berksheim came out? Number one, number one. You name any other nursing home, I don't care how highfalutin it may be, Berksheim came out number one. That was a very, very important sign to me of where I wanted to place my mother. They welcomed her it was such graciousness that she actually got better under the care of the therapist there. They do have a physical therapy department. In fact, several of the therapists that work there used to work at Reading Rehab. I cannot, I, what you had said about the family, Edie, Dicey, right as you go in, there's the desk there. Oh, hi, Dan, how's Norma doing today? You know, it became like family. Another thing that a lot of nursing homes don't have is grounds for people to go out and walk in. Many a summer afternoon, my mother and I would go out to a gazebo, there are several gazebos there, and spend several hours 
just sitting there. And she loved the sun, she loved the warmth, and we visited with other people so that we became like extended family members. My mom did so well up until the very last that she was helping others. They have what is called a VIP program. And she was one of the VEEPs. It means very independent person, meaning that they can go anywhere they want, both inside and outside the institution, without a permission to leave the uh, hallway or the, uh, the unit. I'll never forget, my mom knew everybody. There was something, a handle or something on her wheelchair that wasn't working properly. And so you're not supposed to go down into the basement, but guess what? She pushed the basement button, went down there in her wheelchair and saw, I don't know who it was, she called him by name, but it was one of the repair people, the maintenance people there. Oh, hi Norma, how you doing? Well, this isn't working really well. Well, we'll get right to it. She was so taken care of there, I didn't have to worry. I went up many a time when she was ill a few times and the nurses were very, very concerned and will pull me aside and say, this is what we're doing for. I was kept informed. I was kept, and there was one night she was not doing well. They called me at night saying, I just want to let you know what your mother is, is uh, feeling like. So my experience there was so, so good that like you, I'm here not just for the county, for you all, but for me as well, because I want that place there. That's where I want to go. And one of the things that was missing was the smell. <laughs> I have been in many, many nursing homes. And one of the first things that I have had experiencing in, in that environment was the smell. I tell you, they keep it so clean, you could almost eat off the floor because they're there with a polisher. And I mean, many of the visitors that uh, come in are just astonished at how beautiful, how open, how light. You know, many nursing homes, it's like they're dark. And how clean that place is. And events. You mentioned some of the events. One of the things that I will never forget they bring in a band, I don't know if they still do it, the Swing, uh, swing Fever, which is a, like a Glenn Miller type band. They get as many residents as they can in that room. And here's what I've seen. People that would, you know, drool coming out of their mouth and they're kind of like this. But they start Glenn Miller and they start <laughs> going, yeah. It's bringing joy to these people. It's bringing remembrance to these people. So the activities there, whether it's the picnic, uh, they have a picnic every year. Uh, my mom looked forward to these events. And again, it was a time for socialization, which in many institutions you don't get. You don't get uh, the, the camaraderie among the, the residents there. So I will end up by saying I would be very sad, very sad for you all and for me all <laughs> if, this, if this Heim was sold. I just don't believe, especially when given the history that you pointed out, that we are responsible. I don't have a lot of money. You know, I have food, I have shelter and all, but I know, and did you know that the statistics wise, I think it's almost half of your income that you have saved all your life, and many times more than half of your income, goes out the last two years of your life, not to your family, but to a nursing home. Now that's scary, you've saved your money, you want to have that spent well, but do you want it all to go to a nursing home? That's what happens if we lose this Medicare, Medicaid assisted institution. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. I really, uh, my mom would be very, very upset if we sold it because she was one that, one of many that really was well taken care of. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the speakers, and I don't think I thanked you for coming, so thank you for taking the time to come out on a Saturday morning and be with us and, uh, and to listen to what we have to say, and when we're finished, we want to listen to what you have to say. 
So my portion of this program is to talk about what's been occurring at county commissioners meetings. So I've been attending county commissioners meetings since August of 2017. And I've chosen, I've chosen the ones that I feel are the most important. Okay, so I'm going to start with August 24th. And on August 24th, it was the first time that we heard that the county commissioners were considering selling the Heim. And the reason they were considering doing this was Bob Patrizia, who's the uh, chief financial officer, had projected some deficits. And so uh, on Tuesday, I said he had projected a deficit in 2020 of 1.5 million. And since then, I went back and I looked at an article. He actually projected a deficit in this year of 500,000. And now we are in this year. And when we look at the budget, we see that Berksheim is $1,628,191 in the black. Okay? So when we look at projected numbers and we make decisions on them, you know, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. Anyway, so, um, anyway, when this was announced that it was being considered, there was a huge public outcry. And a lot of people attended county commissioners' meetings. There were people who worked there, people who were family, just community members. They came and they spoke. And because of that outcry, I believe, um, Bob Patricia was asked to come up with what the uh, tax impact would be Oh, let me, let me back up. One of the reasons that the county commissioners were thinking about selling were there were two financial worries, that the Medicaid bed reimbursement rate was flat, that they were not increasing that, and that they really needed an increase in IGT money, which is intergovernmental transfer money. It's money that comes from the federal government, and it goes through the state to the county. The problem is that the state keeps some of that. Okay, and so the negotiation is trying to get some of that money away from the state and to the county nursing home. So what uh, was asked about Patricia was to make um, an estimate of the tax impact if these numbers didn't change, if the Medicaid reimbursement rate didn't change, and if the IGT money did not change. Here's the estimate, and I got this off of Commissioner Barnhart's uh, Facebook page. So this is, the way it's set up, if you look at the pink, you have a house that's assessed at around $41,000. In this year, if those numbers had not changed, it was estimated that, that the person owning that house would owe an additional 91 cents for the entire year to keep birth time and to cover the cost. If your house was assessed at 100,000, you would be paying $2.37 for the entire year. If your house was assessed at $200,000, you would be paying $4.40. I know these are a little hard to see, so I can read them to you. I'm just gonna go through with the $200,000 house, okay? So in 2020, that cost for 2020 would be $10. 21 would be $11. 22, $5. 23, $9. Here's where it spikes, and I'm not sure why, but in 24, $13.60. But that is worst case scenario, okay, for one year. And then 25, 980, 26, 1060, 27, 1060, or you can't see. <laughs> anyway, those are the numbers, and those were the numbers based on the fact that those other two numbers weren't going to change, Medicaid reimbursement rate and IGT. Well, those numbers did change. Yes? Okay, you said those numbers change. In this chart, is uh, any sort of cost of living adjustment factored in, or is that simply... This is his projection. Is the projection of property taxes at the current level, because expenses are going to increase I think that within his projections, I think, I think he was looking at what the deficit is. I think this is your question. I may not be understanding you correctly, but I think he was looking at what the deficit would be for the Heim each year and then how much it would cost to cover that in taxes. But was it factored in that wages will increase that? At the Heim? Yes. Yes. Supplies will increase. Yeah, that would be part that would be part of the projection. Yes. So those numbers, 
the Medicaid reimbursement rate and the IGT, they did change. In February of 2018, we were given an additional or promised an additional a million dollars in IGT money. In June of 2018, they got a 1% increase in the Medicaid bed reimbursement rate. And after being at these meetings, they really did not expect to get that. They were very pleased and very surprised to get that increase in the Medicaid bed reimbursement rate. Then in September of 2018, we had a one-time flow of IGT money of $596,000, and this was due to your county selling their nursing home. So we've had increased revenue flow, which means these, in my opinion, small numbers are, should be smaller. Um, did you ever make that quick paper in the red paper? Is it, did that ever go in the red? It did, I don't know, Karen's here from the reading paper. Did, <laughs> Yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, yeah. It was a letter to the editor. It's not publicized enough. Not enough people know it. This little letter, a lot of people don't read it. Well. It should be like almost headlines. And so are you willing to pay the chart? Never published the chart. Never published the chart. The chart. The chart. The story I about. Yeah, you talked about it. You're right. Yeah. yeah, Karen talked about it in an article, but the chart itself was not in the newspaper. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask with the tax scenarios that you um, have there over the 10 year span, is that based on the population staying roughly the same in the county? Only reason I ask that is, you know, we have these unfortunate things that have happened. Bonton closed, Sears mm -hmm. closed. Now, granted, that's just, you know, one, you know, two employers, but there's people out of jobs. I don't know what else is going to be going on in this particular county as far as concerns over jobs, but mm -hmm. is that based on hopefully the county staying more or less about the same amount of people? The true answer is, I don't know because I didn't do the projection, but I would assume but that yes. more places opening up. Yeah, more places. There's a big mental health unit mm -hmm. opening up, that Reading Hospital is opening up over near St. Joe's Hospital. That's so going to employ, actually that's a question. I think they're saying the employment rate is going up it actually in Berks County. Now, in, in Pennsylvania in general, a lot of people are moving out of New York and New Jersey, and they're moving into the eastern Pennsylvania area. I don't know if that will filter as much towards the Berks County area, mm -hmm. but Pennsylvania is gaining people because of the expenses of New York and New mm -hmm. Jersey. Right. So, I mean, we could, yeah, what were you going to say, Claude? I, I want to say two things. One is, in October of 17, I believe it was um, Kevin Barnhart, the commissioner, uh, who was uh, quoted as providing those 2019 numbers and, and that he had posted the whole chart on his Facebook page. So it's probably still available. That's where I got right. it. It is. <laughs> okay. And, and the, other thing, the other thing is, to that other question, when um, the CFO, our CFO was making um, projections going out of those nine years, he had to build a lot of assumptions in, in inflation, um, cost of living, all kinds of things. Uh, he couldn't be effective if he didn't do some of those, mm -hmm. make some of those basic assumptions and put them in there. Will all those assumptions always pan out? No, that's why it's a projection because you know circumstances do change. You're right, but 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 he would have tried to factor in as many things as he, as he could based on what economists um, were, were projecti projecting and, and probably um, stuff that you could get from the census as well. But I can, we can't speak specifically. Yeah. Okay. All right, so next important meeting would be January 25th. And at this meeting, it was the first time we heard that the commissioners were actually going out for bids and that they were going to seek bids. There was a very lengthy discussion about whether we should go for bids from for-profits or non-profits or a combination of both. There was also a discussion as to who should seek the bids. So uh, both Barnhart and Leinbach wanted Stevens and Lee Griffin Financial and Commissioner Scott wanted Marcus Millichamp, which is a more national firm, and Stevens and Lee is local. So 
what happened that day was, I was at that meeting, uh, Commissioner Scott wanted to go for bids from nonprofits and for profits, and he wanted to use Marcus Millicham. Commissioner Barnhart was also in attendance that day, and he said that he could see Commissioner Scott's point and that we should maybe look at bids from both for-profits and non-profits, but in separate tracks. But he wanted to go with Stevens and Lee, Griffin Financial. Commissioner Leinbach was calling in that day, and he was the one who said no only nonprofits and he dug in his heels and he said I will not consider going for not or for for profits and then Commissioner Barnhart ended up voting with Commissioner Leinbach. So it was a two to one vote to take the for profit component out of that contract with Stevens and Lee and to go with Stevens and Lee. So they voted to only go for nonprofits and to go with Stevens and Lee at that meeting. All right. Next meeting, June 21st. So at this meeting, the recorder of deeds, Fred Sheeler, comments on an agenda item. And he reads it, he says, plan to subdivide a portion of the county property in the area of Berksheim at a fixed fee of $84,900 with Great Valley Consultants, why missing? And then he asks, is that because of anticipation of selling? And then Commissioner Leinbach says it is because of the possibility of that occurring. And then Fred makes a really good point and he says that is a lot of money towards a potential sale. So I didn't mention this when we talked about Stevens and Lee, but the fee that they were retained at was around $30,000 to seek the bids. That's if they don't sell, okay? If they sell, they get 600,000 or 2% or 2.5% or 2.5% commission, commission. Whichever, is greater. whichever is greater so but the point being that 30,000 is is committed to going to Stevens and Lee okay and now 85,000 so now we're over a hundred thousand dollars put towards a sales process if they have all this money to spend putting on bids and all this other kinds of why can't they put that towards the maintenance of first time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're it's our taxpayer money. It's, They're basically well, yeah. these, these are comments that they need to hear. These are comments they need to hear. Okay, June 28th was a very lively meeting. So at June 28th, we find out that they have received preliminary non-binding bids. And we find this out in the comment section of the meeting. Uh, Commissioner Barnhart refers to it. Commissioner Leinbach then follows up and he says, we have received proposals. Seven entities have provided written interest and have met the June 22nd, 5 p.m. deadline. Okay. He says he doesn't have a lot of information yet and that all he could share with us at this point was that the bids range from 30 million to 38 million. Now we've, it, it's been common in this process to hear different numbers. Claudia had 28 million to 38 million. We saw that somewhere. This is actually what they said at that meeting, that 30 million to 38 million. Okay, so we find out that there are bids and so we're surprised by that and then this is the meeting where Commissioner Leinbach and Commissioner Barnhart have to respond to Commissioner Scott's press conference. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but the Tuesday, June 26, Commissioner Scott has a press conference without telling the other commissioners, and he's saying that he will withdraw his support of the sale of the Heim if the unions come back to the table and negotiate. And the other commissioners did not know about this. So here's their response. Commissioner Barnhart goes first and he says, it's unfair to the lowest paid employees. To ask them to give back wages and benefits, if we're gonna do that, we should ask Management Confidential to give back. Okay, so that's his response on that day. Leinbach says his problem with this press conference was that his number one objective has been to address the Medicaid bed reimbursement rates and the IGT money flow, and that this distracts from it. Okay. Also, as an aside, I want to say that as far as labor goes, in the spring, Commissioner Leinbach was at the United Labor Council's public meeting, and when asked by a nurse a question, he said, I don't want the unions to give anything back. 
So at this point in time, this is what's being said about the unions on July or on June twenty eighth. I'm sorry. Next meeting. July 19th is a budget meeting. Claudia and I attend this, oh, and Karen, <laughs> attend this budget meeting. And when it comes to the part where they're talking about the bidders with Stevens and Lee, we're asked to leave. And we sit out in the lobby for maybe, I don't know, what do you think, 20 minutes? Yeah, around 20 minutes. Okay. What was the reason they asked you to do that? Was that not a public meeting? It was a public meeting, but the portion that they were Discussing, discussing right there then had to do with real estate, is that correct? And that's why they asked us to leave. Now, when we came back in to the meeting, they provided us with this packet, and this is from Griffin's Financial. So we're sitting there and we're looking at our packet, and what we see is this page that talks about who they saw it as bidders. I don't know if you can see this, but they're saying they went out for bidders and they got 237 bidders. Okay? Of those 237 bidders, nonprofit strategic institutions, there were 154. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait, they were all supposed to be nonprofits. Okay? 50 private equity firms that have interest in nursing homes, 22 for profit for-profit strategic companies who already own nursing homes, 11 real estate investment trusts that have interest or real estate in nursing homes, okay? So we don't, you don't say anything at these budget meetings. So we're just sitting here thinking, why aren't these all nonprofits? But then you have this down here. Potential bidders were told at the bid instructions that the purchaser that will operate and manage the home is or will be a nonprofit. Okay? So that's meaning that somebody can buy this as a for profit institution and create a nonprofit and have that be the nonprofit that is running the Heim. When did you ever see anybody invest money and not want a profit? <laughs> You need to call the commissioners. <laughs> All right. Okay, so the other, oh, let me show you the other thing from this meeting that was in the packet. So this is the process summary, the sale process summary. So they, they sent out for bids, right, 237. Only 16 people of those 237 said, yes, we want to review your materials. So they reviewed, out of those 16, seven people submitted those preliminary non-binding bids. Okay, then we had Commissioner Scott's press conference which halted the whole process, okay? Now, we're, I'm gonna get to this meeting next, well, in two meetings, but we're back in the sales process and we were informed at this past meeting that we were at the management meeting, site visits, and confirmatory due diligence. That's getting scheduled right now. People are being scheduled to tour the Heim. Okay, September 11th. There, there, so remember the survey where I said that it was $85,000 to have land surveyed and they, they broke it into three parcels. They have to submit this plan to Burn Township. So on September 11th, they submitted the plan to Burn Township. Burn Township said that they needed, set, well, we know they said that because Ron Seaman at the September 13th meeting, commissioner's meeting, told us that they said they needed several minor revisions to conform to ordinances. He also said it is not pursuant to an imminent sale. We don't know for a fact if the plan has been revised. We do know it has not been relooked at by Burn Township yet. And we also know through the planning commission at Berks County <coughs> that they have to approve that before a sale can go forward. So we're watching what's happening in Burn Township. December 6th. Okay, so this is where the sale process have restarted. On, on December 6th, George Hadlick Esquire reports on the negotiations with the unions and his report is that in the beginning it looked very promising and as it progressed it was less promising and in the end he said they were having trouble getting even calls back from the union. Now the articles in the newspaper when the unions got to address this said you know they had disagreed with some of those points. 
At this meeting, after this report, Scott reinstates going forward with the sale process and resuming the process of sale, he says. Leinbach is phoning into this meeting and he responds by saying that he's shocked and disappointed if they, the union leadership, were willing to give up week, the weekend differential, they could have stopped the sale. So he is firmly placing the decision to sell on the backs of the unions not negotiating right here. And, okay, so, line back, sorry. <laughs> um, after he makes that comment, he seconds he gives Scott the second that he needs and says that he will support reopening the sale process. Next, it goes to Barnhart. Commissioner Barnhart says he is a no vote, but he does chastise the unions for not negotiating. And if we remember back on June 28th, what Commissioner Barnhart said when Commissioner Scott said that he was going to, for unions to negotiate, he said this is unfair. And now all of a sudden, at this point, it had become fair and, the, and really the only decision point. All right, so that's December 6th. And Claudia is just going to quickly uh, report on the budget meeting that she attended that I did not attend, which was December 13th, which I don't have a slide for. OK. OK, so in the, in the morning at that meeting, December 13th, um, the commissioners continued to emphasize that they didn't want to sell the Heim. They were doing everything they could not to sell the Heim. And it, and, and it wasn't a firm decision to sell, sell the Heim. But in the afternoon at the budget meeting, when there was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion about potentially opening the bidding, opening the bidding so that they could have more than the seven, and they actually were only going to consider the five. What the um, Michael Vint, the representative from um, Stevenson Lee, who was discussing it, um, when asked how that would affect the timeline of selling the high, he said, well, it could extend the timeline by two months. And the commissioners um, felt that they didn't want it to be extended by two months. They were hoping to wrap up um, final proposals by the end of February. So they decided not to reopen the bidding. So that was a little different from the, from the way people were left feeling in the morning. I have one more slide. This is a slide of the 2019 proposed budget consumption of taxes and fund balance in comparison by function. I want to show you where the Heim is. That should be the paper. <laughs> okay, that's where the Heim is. If we are truly looking to be responsible with taxpayer money, why is that the rectangle that we're going after? And right now, when it is not losing money. I want to thank you all for being so attentive. We're going to have questions, I, but I just want to say something before I forget. <laughs> Over on the side table, there are papers that have contact information for the commissioners and state representatives. They also have uh, some other additional information, so pick one of those up, please, if you don't have one. There's a sign-up sheet if you are interested in being updated. If you want to know what's going on, just put your name, phone number, email address on that, and we'll contact you. And I just really want to thank you for being here on a Saturday morning. Questions? Yeah, I, I'd like to oh. say one thing, oh. and, it's, and I believe it's on one of those, but I think it bears mentioning, is that commissioners, the, the public commissioners' meetings where you can actually make comments are Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock every week, with rare exceptions. I mean, there was a one Christmas week. On the 13th floor of the, of the county services building next to the courthouse. And that address is on that paper. Right. Mm -hmm. And the times are on that and paper. It, and budget meetings take place on Thursday afternoons, usually at 2. If there's a change, a change in the time, unfortunately, it gets announced in the morning when the CFO makes his presentation. But you won't get a response to your question. <laughs> well, depends. <laughs> that depends. That depends. It's, it used to be, in the first few months that we were going, that it would, you could have almost a conversation. You could ask a question, there'd be an answer, you could have a follow-up question. That's not so true anymore. Um, it's at the discre discretion. They have a new policy that it's supposed to be the comment section, therefore only comments. But, but sometimes 
they will respond to your comments yeah, so anyway. Do. And and you can you can frame your comment as like you know I have a question that I hope you will answer it's, you know or something. They Did might not, but, but you're you're still getting your point across. I yes. have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Mark, Mark Rossi. You know. Oh, good. If he can push it a little bit. Thank you. I just had my father in his first time, and he's so happy. Oh. Very, very, very happy. We lost everything from Hurricane in Texas. I just brought him back not too long ago. And he, I didn't know where to stuck him. I stuck him in a couple of facilities. Come on up here. Like do you have a picture of your father? Yes. I Come up here. I just, <laughs> I Come on up here because we're filming and you can... I did not like the care at some of the facilities. Mm -hmm. When I saw him in first time, I saw him so happy and he's smiling and heard a rumor of the closing. I said, I said, my God, he has dementia, you know, come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he loves it so much. So we spent Halloween up there with him. Mm -hmm. And Show everybody. He, just, he just really, really enjoys it up there. Uh, he, I think it's the best care ever. And I, when I had him in other facilities, I was so disappointed. And I'm just so happy that I have him there and he's happy because he lost everything in, from a hurricane in Texas and I have nowhere to go with him. I have multiple sclerosis myself and working and trying to keep providing. And I like him there and I want it to stay that way. I want the best care. I know they're getting paid so much, but that's what they're there for. They sh you can see it when you walk in that place. You can see the cleanliness when you walk in that place. You can smell it. And the nurses are so pleasant. They go out of your way. If he has an emergency, they call you. They really do care. And I don't want to see no changes. I hope for the best it keeps going the way it is. We don't need like facilities that get paid lower, and then mm -hmm. they say, well, we don't have time to change his, his diaper. Right, right. That's, what that, that was rude, <coughs> I thought. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but I talked to my Mark Rossi. Mm -hmm. I see, why can't they do the proposal of helping, like, what do they do with all this drug money? Take some of this drug money, the, yeah. and boom, boom. <laughs> I don't know what they do with but the forfeiture money. I don't know. Help out there. Mm -hmm. There's money that you can be shifted around, and in fact, at one um, county commissioner meeting, the CFO, uh, Bob Patrizio, was saying they're not going to raise taxes this year because, you know, the deficit was so negligible, it was a little over one-third percent. Well, the deficit that was projected for Burke's time was one-fifth or less percent. So if you can move things around for one expense, you can move them around no, for another. No. <laughs> I know I work in a living facility now, but I enjoy it. This is one of the good ones. We recommend our people to go to Burke's Hall because they have nowhere to go when their money runs out. Yeah. Where are they going to go? Thank you out so the street. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Well, I'm just wondering at this point what can even be done. I mean, it seems as though the sale is going to happen? Well, we can't give up. <laughs> we can't give up. We, we don't know that the sale is going to happen. We can take the commissioners at their word. They are saying they do not want to sell. So what we can do is we can, we can call and we can say, we hear you saying you don't want to sell. We've looked at the numbers. We don't think you need to sell. Well, it doesn't even make any sense. And There's it, not even a bona fide, serious enough reason to sell. We agree. we agree. We agree. I got to check with Ann back here because she may need something for the library. I just want to say that two things. Yeah. One is, it's really important that people show up at the commissioners meetings. Which I haven't done, but it is really important. Mm -hmm. If you can make it on a Thursday morning, it is. And the other thing is, this is an election year, and two of the three commissioners are up for re-election. So they need to know how people feel about this before the primary election in May. And you can say this is something you will vote on. I mean, people have things that they will vote on, right? This is, you know. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Uh, it is the job of the newspaper and the radio stations, the news, news reporters, to keep people informed. They have not kept us informed. That chart should be in the newspaper. There should be some reporter really playing this up. That I think we have one. <laughs> we, have, we have the one from the county commissioner. We need to make mm -hmm. a project of it. And they won't have to do it for long because they're talking about what the end of February. Mm -hmm. 
but they really should get bring this to the people and, and said, are you willing to pay maybe ten dollars a year to keep this place going? Yes. When it may affect everyone in Berks County, either a family member mm -hmm. or themselves. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm totally amazed as a volunteer. I've been going and I was on the volunteer service board at Berks mm High, -hmm. but I've gone to probably in my thirty nine years, thirty of the volunteer appreciation lunches that they have. Mm -hmm. And at those lunches, these same commissioners stand up mm -hmm. and they give all these accolades to the home and how well it's run and how good the state farm. How can you stand up in front of us as volunteers and give all these accolades and then turn around and want to sell the place? They're politicians. Right. Yeah. 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 It, it just, but that infuriates me right. because that tells you the honesty. And I've heard it just in some of the stuff how they waver with their opinions depending, I guess. Well, the not the not for profit to the for profit, I just don't understand. I've got a question over here. Actually, it's more of a, a statement. Okay. Um, I have met with one of the commissioners. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mention names with several different ideas and he was very receptive and uh, explained the IGT and the Medicare flat mm -hmm. or the Medicaid rather flat rate and we talked about several other ideas uh, to cut expenses many of my ideas were uh, would come a cropper of the union um, because it would involve uh, sponsored internships for students in local colleges to have an internship if they were studying uh, a, a medical uh, profession, etc. I think they took your idea on that. I think I saw that come through. Well. So good job. That's fine. <laughs> um, you know, I'm the type of person that it, it, good ideas, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter who it is. Mm -hmm. Maybe the idea. If, if I give an idea and someone else can run with it better, have at it. Um, but the one thing that this uh, very responsive commissioner said to me at the end of our, of our discussion thanked me for my concern and for coming to him with ideas. Because now I'm going to tell you what he said and I'm going to tell you a statement further on that. Mm -hmm. Because he said, everyone who contacts me either says, sell the home or keep the home. He said, you are the only one who've come to me with ideas on how to keep it for going forward for all the wonderful reasons you pointed out. I have new relatives in there. I might end up in there one day. I took care of my mother in my home until she was 100 years old. She never wanted to go to any nursing facility. And as life worked out for her, it was not necessary. Um, but my point on this chart is this is a wonderful chart okay it shows basically what we want to show that the Heim is low on the mm -hmm. budget numbers but has your group or anyone um, I'm a bookkeeper but it's a little bit beyond me I think you need mm -hmm. another person that's a full loan account um, Anyone like that to volunteer to look at this budget? This chart comes from the budget. So what is in public safety that is not 100% necessary? What is in general government that is not? In other words, don't just say, oh, look at this, now you fix it. No, no, no. I, I'm come up with some ideas by looking at the budget, and let me tell you, Looking at budgets like this is a task because in past residences, I've gone to the school board meetings and oh my lord, 
lot of going on to get one number about what they spend on something. So there are layered budgets, so you need someone who can look into it. And then you need to go through and point out, well, look it, you could shift this from public safety because, yeah, it's nice, but it's not necessary. And let's put it over here. And, but give them some solutions. Give them some ideas for solutions and see how it works out. Yeah, I mean, and, and, the, and the taxes calling, I'm sorry, um, calling my commis commissioner, asking them to increase the taxes. <laughs> no, no, not asking that's, them. That's, mm. not, that's not a solution because, as she said, he's projecting numbers. You don't know what may happen in the future that even though you increase the taxes, that takes care of it for a little while. Now the expenses are increasing and then in a few years you're, you're right back in the same problem. So let's look at solutions. There's all kinds of solutions like, like I said, internships for the, for the college kids that are studying, but that would require uh, as people age out in the union, maybe you don't replace them, maybe you have one RN supervising three interns, so anything like that, okay? I'm just throwing these ideas out. They're not all ironed and pressed and starched, of course. Um, but uh, corporate sponsorship. Yeah. I always think they but should have medical like corporations endowment funds or something, too. There's a lot of people who would give money for endowment. You know, right. It's to, to get this. Have big events. Have, have like, like a, a, I hate to say fundraising, but it'd be mm -hmm. more like um, having events where you encourage people to will some of their money when they pass away. Um, have an event somehow where you could sponsor a bed. To get this work done, they're all really great ideas. We have to halt. We have to put a halt on the sale because once it's sold, these ideas, we can't implement them. I could be wrong, but I don't think a sale is eminent. Just from everything I've read and what, it's not unusual for entities such as this to send out bids and see what they are and, and try to use those to uh, budget going forward for the CFO to make decisions. I don't think getting bid, I don't think you should automatically assume that getting bids means they've decided to sell it. Right, and we are working on worst case scenario because we have to. If we assume they're not gonna sell it and they sell it, it's sold, right? So we're working on worst case scenario, and I will, I will admit to that. I will admit well, to that. Well, admit that you're working in a worst case scenario, and then come up with, but here, here's a solution. So we, we must have this worst case. Scenario. Well, we, we have been, we have been working to get, you know, additional I'm monies. Not and yeah, I'm yeah. Just, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say, if, if looking at that chart with the ten-year span of time, if you're telling me that for you know average people here with maybe an average home of two hundred thousand, and in ten years' time, I would only have to pay maybe thirteen dollars more. I wouldn't even care if it was a hundred dollars more a year. That is nothing. You don't go out to dinner sometime, or you don't uh, buy yourself a new outfit, or go to a theater like to save something this big that's going to affect so many of us in the long run. I think that is just like such a pointless thing, and it is such a glaring solution to the problem that I don't understand why people don't get that. that there's no reason why I wouldn't spend that money to save Burke's time, because I could end up there, my husband could end up there, or his children could end up there. It, it, it just seems ridiculous to me. I can't even believe that the commissioners are fighting and having these arguments and having all this stuff going on over that itty-bitty tax increase. I, I'm sorry, but it's just 
unbelievable to me that this whole stupid thing is going on over needing to do a little bit of a tax increase. Well, and they it's need like nothing, nothing. So they need to hear all these comments. I'm not. I'm not trying to say who should comment and who shouldn't comment. They need to hear all these comments. Yes, Chris. And I've been reading the article to comment on what you're saying. I've been following the newspaper and the articles, and maybe I did come in here late, so maybe talk about it. But mm -hmm. Um, I only saw one little thing, and that was in an editorial mm -hmm. paper maybe yesterday about what it would cost, that $10 on a $200,000 house, or way less on a, on a, on a lower-value home. And I think most people in our community have no idea. And you read the big thing where the commissioners say, oh, well, we're gonna, we don't want to raise taxes on our, on our um, community, but if, we, if more people knew what that was going to be, I think they would agree with what you're saying. We all might have someone who's been touched by her time or will at some time be, and maybe we just need to start spreading the word and talking to everybody we know, and not only calling the commissioner, but calling the newspaper. And we need, yeah. That. I think we need to work together as a community, right? We're not all going to agree on every single facet of this, but if we agree that we want to keep Berksheim, then we come up with ideas, we contact the commissioners, and we tr and now is the time. We can't, we cannot wait because we don't know. We don't know. We know there's a po possible deadline of the end of February or a mentioned deadline. There, yeah, there's sheets over there. There's the phone number of the county commissioners, the email address, whatever way you would prefer to do it. I think they just need to hear your opinions. Claudia, yeah. a real number that you were talking about is half the people on the Medicare, Medicaid, are, are Medicaid, Medicaid, sorry, on Medicaid from Burke's time and Burke's County. I'm talking I'm, uh, in terms of beds. In terms of beds. Karen, Karen may have this number for me. <laughs> and I well, believe what Christian and Lundbach have said, and I have not been kind of like confirm this, is that more Medicaid designated beds exist at the Hunts. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Exist at the first time than all of the county So 80% of all the people on Medicaid. No. 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 Oh, okay. Eighty percent of all the beds at first time were Medicaid people. Those those beds are more than all the other that are available at other county homes. What's the number of beds at uh, first time? Four hundred. Four hundred and something. Oh no. Um, yeah, I think. They just, I don't know. It was around 400 and something. It's 400 and something. Okay, thank you so much. 80% of that are Medicaid. The, the point is, of the available beds, Medicaid beds in the county, it carries the weight. The Heim has more Medicaid beds than the beds that are available at all the other nursing homes in the county combined. That's a great resource. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> and? How many, how many counties have a birth time? There's 16 now. Seven, there's 17 now. I thought it was 16 now. Or maybe 16, 16 additional. Six, I thought it was 17, 17, 17 including us. Okay. Pennsylvania has a home. No, because a number of them in the last few years have sold. Okay. So but the results have, have not been wonderful. For those nursing right. homes, I, I you know I hate to preach, but I'm going to because I think it's really important that we all remember that the government is us, mm -hmm. and right. the commissioners work for us, and Bergstein belongs to us. Mm -hmm. So if we don't want it sold, we have an obligation to work to to convince them to not sell. It. So we we have to call. We yes. have to write, I mean, have and to if possible, up. we have to show up to those to those yeah. to those meetings yeah. because they look and they see that the people care enough to come. Yeah. You know, and if you can't come yourself, maybe you know other other people who could go. But some people, right. it's, it's at an inconvenient time for some people to yes, come. So, is. so if you can't come, do not feel bad about that. Just give a call. Yeah, just right? give a call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Call or write, and if you go, when it comes to the comment section at the end of the meeting. It's not like you have to go give a speech. You can just stand up and say, I'm here because I want you to know that I want the hind kept in, in county hands, period. Or don't, please don't sell the hind. 
If these meetings, you don't have to you don't have to say a lot. If these meetings exist every Thursday, mm -hmm. does the topic of the Heim come up at every Thursday? No, but it doesn't no. have to. You there's public comment at the end. You can talk about whatever you want. You get three minutes. Right. Okay. You so don't, you don't have to. It doesn't have to come up in that meeting to bring it up. But they're saying about okay with the newspaper that this has to be put out there. What about all the other communication? We have a TV mm -hmm. in the and they have what's happening in your town and what's happening. Mm -hmm. Can't all this information be put out there for the people on public TV on any kind of communication? It's, uh, yeah, channel 30. Yeah, which yeah. Is 69 just actually had a nice article on their website from Tuesday. From Tuesday's and meeting. Had a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, the quotes in, mm -hmm. in regards to what all of us said and some of the, the questions, but it wasn't on the TV itself, right. but they did have the, uh, they announced on Monday that the meeting was going to be on Tuesday. On Tuesday. So, right. And Chen, like she said, if you look at that budget chart, if you took each department and just took a quarter of a percent mm -hmm. out of each one of those budget figures that maybe is unnecessary and moved it into the line. Mm -hmm. And what's in miscellaneous? We, well, we don't, see, we don't, that's the thing. They just need to know that the political will is there and the public opinion is that we want to keep this. Less work to keep this. Yes, Anne. I also want to say that the commissioner's meetings are televised live from gavel to gavel yeah. on BCTV every Thursday and then they're replayed. And if you don't have Comcast and can't get them on cable, Watch you can watch them online for they sure. Also, they also um, they broadcast them Saturdays at three o'clock. Yes. 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 This this <laughs> woman didn't get a chance to say anything. <laughs> I've just been listening. Uh, my mother is a resident. Okay. And I want you to know that the residents there are just as concerned. You know what's going to happen to us. You know this place closes, and uh, you have people there who were active in the community, you know, okay, just because they're old and they're there now, their minds don't all shut down, no. you know, they're, they're, um, they're concerned, you know, if this place closes, you know, where do we go, or, you know, what kind of care are we going to get, and uh, they do get wonderful care. When my mother went there, she hated it, hated it. I went home thinking I'm the worst daughter, you know, to have to put my mother here. She I mean, nothing, nothing would satisfy her. And I understand it's hard, you know, to go there, you have your home, you mm -hmm. have everything, now all of a sudden you need extra care, and here you are, you know. And uh, now she has come around, she likes it, she makes friends, they talk, and, you know, they talk about stuff like this, they talk about her events, you know, they're talking about the politics and and things like that. So it's sad to see, you know, now they're concerned what's going to happen to us. Well, if you want to bring a piece of paper to the high, maybe they would feel somewhat empowered to call. Yes, I will do that. Yeah, I we announced it thank you. on Wednesday with the residents. You did, well, okay. Was, yeah. You know, and we asked, there was a lot of family there. When we, we do yeah, 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 yeah. on a Wednesday, it's amazing mm -hmm. how many family members come up and sit with us. And they know us as way that I'm mm -hmm. familiar to him. Mm -hmm. But so the residents, they're all keen, they know what's going on. A lot of them read the paper, they mm -hmm. watch 69 News, so they know what's going on. And I'm sure some of the staff have probably spoken to them as well. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, I think we have another, wait, I, can I take this one last comment? I, I've got the cut sign, so it has to be kind of quick. <laughs> well, I was just going to suggest that one story in the newspaper or one chart, those are all good. But what about the paper doing a human interest ongoing, what's the word, help me out here? Series. A series. A series. Sure. A series. Like articles, like you have your sections. I don't know. Well, they have a section now, what yeah. you're saying, of Things in red. Yeah, once a day they had Whiskey Ditch. I didn't know Whiskey Ditch was being Lincoln Park. I know when the Professor Schnitzel lived over in Whiskey Ditch. <laughs> but you have your different, different sections. You got your business section, you got your Berks and Beyond, you got your real estate, you got those things. And, and they 
have something in them each week. Camp, what about something each week about the community interest of our Berks Pine County Nursing Village? We need them. And we need to take care of them. And we're all going to be old one day. So, we need to call our commissioners. That's definitely a part of it. But it, it, it has to be a tapestry of our nations. Thank you. I, we're going to wrap up because there's another event in this room, so we we can we'll mingle if you want to if you want to talk about anything. But we need to let them set up the room for the next event.